good to have you back in church tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, something's going to happen tonight. Because I have come expecting. Amen. We serve a God who is greater and stronger than anything that we face. You believe that? Put your hands with us tonight and let's worship.
thanksgiving we also know that the scripture tells us that if there's any sick we're to call for the elders of the church which lay hands on them and to anoint them with oil you know with everything that's going on with covid we've kind of stepped back away from that a little bit but i believe tonight there are some situations in this room either you yourself need a touch or someone close to you needs a touch I'm going to ask you tonight if that's you, if you need a touch in your body or you want to come stand in for somebody, I'm going to ask you to come right across this front. You can spread out. But sometimes I feel like we need to take that step of faith. I, I know we have some that, um, Becky, would you come stand in for Mr. Mr. Tommy that's facing surgery tomorrow? Mr. Cecil, will you come stand in for Bonnie? Let's pray. We have numbers, numbers that... Would you stand in for Miss Becky Edgar's family, her mom and her daughter right there? The song we sang says there's nothing impossible. Amen. There's nothing impossible. You believe that? Is it just words that we say or do we really believe it? Would you stretch a hand this direction? You may not know the exact need, but God does. Would you stretch a hand this direction?
situation. You are more than enough. You believe that tonight? Jesus, you're everything that I have need of. You're more than enough. God, let that resonate in our spirits tonight. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. And you don't do anything halfway. You provide what we need, step by step, moment by moment. Even when we can't see your work in God, we know that you're working. I thank you, God, that you are more than enough. You are everything we have need of tonight. And I pray tonight, Lord, as we open up your word, God, that that would just resonate in our spirit and it would be something that we wouldn't just leave here at the altar tonight or we wouldn't just leave in this building but Lord as we go throughout this week make us mindful of that keep that on the forefront of our minds Jesus you are enough you are enough you are more than enough for me we thank you we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus we pray attitude of prayer for just a moment. Just right where you're seated. Just right where you're seated. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you so thankful we can bring our needs to this altar. Aren't you so thankful that he knows what we have need of even before we get up here? Can I get a couple of our board members to come and pray? with Mr. Derwood this morning, this evening. Let's just surround him. May I just stretch a hand this way? You know, whatever, whatever this need is that's going on right here, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to lift it up. We're to stand in the gap with him right now.
bit of what we talked about this morning. Jesus is very intentional. And if he would orchestrate a 64 mile journey to go and sit at a well and wait on one woman. Wow. Wow. We don't have to get in a hurry. Because Jesus thinks we're worth the wait. Amen. We are worth the wait. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are intentional. Thank you, God, that you orchestrate moments to encounter us. That you meet us right where we are right in the midst of the situation that we're in. And you bring hope and you bring life. You bring that living water. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being intentional with us and thank you for waiting on us, Lord. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lift your hands toward heaven and let's thank you.
You may be seated tonight. Thank you so much for your patience tonight and just allowing the Lord to do those things that he needs to be doing and moving in each of our hearts and our lives. Amen. Amen. We have a, a number tonight that are at Baccalart. We have some um, young men and women who are uh, graduating this week, and we have some that even now are slipping out and have to go to that tonight. And um, we just want to pray that the Spirit of the Lord would be there tonight, amen, as they uh, have baccalaureate service and they focus on the presence of the Lord. So, Father, we just ask right now that right over there at that gym and in, in, at Patrician Academy, Lord, where where these young people are gathered, Lord, and they're, they're being reminded as they step into life, God, they're being reminded, Lord, that they need to keep you center. And, Father, I just pray, Lord, that... Uh, whoever's in charge of that service over there, whoever's working, at, uh, at that, that whoever's speaking over there tonight, Lord, that your spirit would just surround them, Lord, and that you would just give them the words that they need for that moment. And God, that the young people's lives would be challenged. And Father, they would leave that place knowing that they have heard a word from you. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. This morning we talked about the difference between a meeting and an encounter. And we said, you know, that meetings are usually planned and they're predictable, whereas encounters usually happen um, in other ways. And a lot of times a meeting, we can leave a meeting and not really be affected, but we're not going to leave an encounter without being changed and somehow. And so this morning we talked about the woman at the well. And tonight, I want to talk about another encounter. Um, and this is, a, this is a very, very familiar story. And, you know, you might be sitting here saying, Sister Phyllis, why, why did you preach this morning on the woman at the well? And why are you preaching on this topic tonight? We know these stories. We've, we've grown up with these stories. We've, we've listened to them. That's the whole problem. A lot of times, we get so accustomed to hearing these accounts from God's word that we skim them. You know, we just skim read them while well, I've read that before. You know, I know in, in doing our Bible study and reading through the Bible in a year, like a lot of us have been doing, they challenge you that once you read through the Bible in a year and you start it over the next year, they challenge you to get a different version of the Bible. Okay? Why is that? Because if you tend to read the same thing over and over and over again, you're going to skim it. You're not going to really dive into it. Whereas if you're reading different versions, you have to dig a little bit deeper. You know, I know y'all noticed that because, you know, my husband was always a KJV person. He preached from KJV, and these guys had no problem following him up there. I tend to be an ESV version, and so they're like, Mm, which one's close to this? And Brother Lindy, thank you for working so hard on that this morning. But I'm going back to KJV tonight, so it'll be a little bit easier for you guys to follow me. Um, but I want us to dig a little deeper into a very familiar story tonight. And we're going to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to start uh, at verse 1. And Acts chapter 9, that should immediately resonate in your spirit as to what we're fixing to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about Saul we're going to talk about the encounter that Saul had with Christ, okay? But I don't want you to see it as, well, Saul was persecuting the church and the Lord dropped him to his knees on the road to Damascus and then he wasn't persecuting the church anymore. I want us to dig a little bit deeper and recognize that there were some very specific things that happened in this encounter that maybe we can apply to our lives and recognize that they need to be happening in our life. Okay, as we encounter Christ. So let's start. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, 
whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said to Lord, Wilt th- what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what you must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. Now Saul is completely opposite of the lady that we talked about this morning. Would you agree with that? This lady that we talked about this morning, the woman at the well, she's a complete outcast. You know, nobody wants anything to do with her. She's dejected. She's alone. Okay. But that's not Saul. Saul is a very highly respected Pharisee. Okay. He's learned. He has studied. He, he, ha- he, he runs with the, with the crowd. Okay. He runs with the powers that be. He's an influential person. Okay. This very fact alone tonight brings me encouragement. We talked about this morning that Jesus is no respecter of persons. And this encounter we're talking about tonight, when compared with the one from this morning, it proves that to us. Jesus is no respecter of persons. Okay? He went out of his way to encounter this poor outcast woman this morning. And tonight we see that he goes and does the very same thing with Saul. He's going to encounter Saul now, okay? So that shows me no respecter of persons right here. Saul knew who he was too. You know, I think the woman at the well this morning, I think she was kind of uncertain of her worth and she was uncertain of, of who she was and what the purpose of her life was. Saul was not that way. He knew who he was. He could, he could, you know, if we were talking about dogs, we'd be talking about pedigree, Okay, Saul, Saul could talk, tell you his pedigree. He could tell you his ancestry line. He could take you all the way back, you know, 2,000 years to Abraham. And he could tell you which tribe he descended from, which was Benjamin. Okay, if you read the scriptures, he could tell you all these things. He was a Jew and he was a proud Jew. And he had upheld the law and he had studied the law. He had done everything to the letter of the law. He was a circumcised Jew, okay, which was what was required of the men at that particular time, okay. He prided himself on the way he kept the law. He talked about how he kept the law. And Saul was a man on a mission. Have you ever been just determined to do something and and get well into that process of doing something and then realize <laughs> you were wrong. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? Been headed full steam in one direction and then realize, whoops, that was wrong. Well, here's the thing. Saul didn't know he was wrong. He didn't understand he was wrong at this, mor- at, at this moment right here. Saul was going full steam ahead, doing exactly what he thought God would have him do. He was protecting his Jewish upbringing. He was protecting what he knew to be truth. And there was a particular group of people that were referred to as followers of the way, okay, that were wrecking havoc to their Jewish law and their Jewish customs. And what does he do? He sees this happening and he says, I can't let that happen. They're totally throwing my known world into an upheaval. Now we know who he's talking about right here. Okay. We have the beauty of looking back and reading the history and knowing what's going on. Saul didn't have that at the time. Remember this is happening current with Saul. Would you do the same thing? Would you do the same thing? Let me prove to you that you would. Can I prove to you that you would? As COVID hit, and there began to be different opinions as to what should take place, and it began to affect 
how the government was going. Okay. How many of you had the urge to get up on a stump and say, that's not right. That's not right. We're losing our rights. We're losing, we're losing this. We're losing everything that we've, that we've come accustomed to. We've lo- we're losing everything that America is stand, stands for. I read a, a news report this afternoon about a pastor in Canada that's been arrested. You know, they drug him off to jail because he broke their, their COVID laws. Now, I haven't read deep enough into it to know. You know, we've been talking in Sunday school about, you know, how to respectfully deal with laws and things like that. I haven't read enough into it to know, but, but here's a pastor that's been arrested now in Canada, and I'm sure that his congregation is up on a stump and saying, they're trying to take over. They're trying to, they're trying to control what we got. So we get, our, we get our feathers ruffled when we feel like people are trying to do something like that. And this is where Saul was right here. Saul was trying to be the best Jew he knew how to be. And this group of followers of this crazy man, Jesus, were wrecking havoc in in his known world and everything that was going on there. They were becoming a threat to the beliefs he so strongly had held on to. And he was determined he was going to do away with them. And that's what he's in the process of doing when we get to the scripture that we find right now. But let's back up just a little bit. Do you remember who Saul was? Do you remember where he first came on the scene? The first time we see any mention of Saul is back in Acts chapter 6. And you know what's happening there? One of these followers of the way, Stephen, okay, his, is, is stepping out. And, and the scripture tells us in Acts 6, 8, it describes Stephen as being full of grace and power, He was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And he was creating havoc. Sharing the gospel. Sharing the good news. Sharing what we know to be truth today. Okay? But right then they didn't know that. And this upset a group of people there. Members of the local synagogue got all upset about it. And and they... They brought him before the Sanhedrin. And they said, this, this man is, he's going against our laws. He's blaspheming. He's, you know, we got to do something about Stephen. And if you've never really read it before, go back and read Acts chapter 7 in its entirety. You know what Stephen is doing? He's laying out the gospel. He's laying out. He's connecting. You know, we talked this morning about how Jesus just asked the lady for a drink of water. And then he bridged the gap with his conversation and this is what Stephen's doing. Stephen is, he's given his defense, but he's beautifully telling the story of Jesus and how Jesus is actually the culmination of, of the promise to Abraham. And he's sharing that with them, but he goes a step further. He says, and you killed him. Yee. That's a little bold, right? But Stephen was operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you think they did when he said that? That's enough of you. And they drug him out to the edge of the city. And it said they got ready to stone him. And you know what they did? They took their coats and they laid it down at the feet of a young man named Saul. And that's the first time we hear of Saul. Acts seven fifty eight. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then Acts 8 verse 1 says, And Saul approved of his execution. Saul was all for it. Now an interesting thing happened right there after Stephen was martyred. The followers of Jesus became scattered. You know why that happened? Because persecution of the church began to rise. If you look at statistics today, I follow the voice of the martyrs. I don't know how how many of y'all follow that. But if you look at statistics today, the fastest growing churches in the world are happening in North Korea and China. Do you know why? 
persecution. And they've gone underground. Persecution has a way of spreading the gospel. And this is what happened. You can see it happening. As, as Christians were being persecuted, they began to scatter. And everywhere they went, they began to share the gospel with the people that they encountered there. And this is how the gospel just began to spread like wildfire. Well, this created a problem for Saul. Because at first, all he had to do was go from door to door to door in Jerusalem and grab them by the nap of the neck and haul them off to, to jail you know, these followers. So he stayed pretty busy, but he was right there at home. All of a sudden now, after the, the martyrdom of Stephen, the, the gospel began to spread because the, the Christians had been scattered. And it was spreading like wildfire. And, and Saul was like, i got to stop this. And I've got to go all in these outlying areas and begin to grab these people and bring them in and, and hold them accountable for what they're doing. So he, you know, this ain't Kansas anymore. You know, I can get away with a lot in Choctaw County that I can't get away with in Lauderdale County. Why is that? Because they know, y'all know me here, okay? You know, I used to pick at my husband all the time. He would go through town a little bit fast. And I'd say, baby, you need to slow down. You're going to get a ticket. I'm not going to get a ticket. And he was right. He wasn't going to get a ticket, you know. But he wouldn't do that in Lauderdale County, Okay. All of a sudden, Saul couldn't just go grab all these people from all these different places and begin to, to, to take them and put them in jail. He had to have permission. He had to have papers or documents that allowed him to go, kind of like a warrant for their arrest, that he, that he allowed, could go and get these people from these different places. And so this is what he's done. He's gone, and he's asked for permission. He's asked for paperwork to begin to go collect the followers of the way and bring them back. You know what? I don't think Saul had the slightest idea what he was getting into. I don't think he had the slightest idea what he was, what he was battling. Okay? Now, Saul and Paul, a lot of people, a lot of people miss misunderstand or they incorrectly think that after the conversion of Saul, he became Paul, okay? But what we have to understand is Saul was his Hebrew or his Jewish name, and Paul was his Roman name, okay? And it was common for people to have two names at that time, okay? So he was Jewish, and his Jewish name was Saul, but he was also a Roman citizen, and in Rome, he was known as Paul, Okay, so because of the circles he began to run in after his conversion, he was running not with the Jews anymore. He was running with the Gentiles who were Greek, okay, who called him Paul because that was his Roman name, okay. So here we are back in Acts chapter 9, going to pick up at verse 3, and we're going to see that as Saul sets out on his journey from Jerusalem to Damascus, the first thing that Saul's going to experience in his encounter is going to be disorientation. How many of you have ever been disoriented before? It's no fun. <laughs> I do that with my vertigo sometimes, and I don't know which way is up, and that's not fun. Pick up at verse 3, what we just read. We're going to read verse 3 again. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he's trembling and he's astonished. I want you to remember those two words. He's trembling and he's astonished. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told thee what you must do. Now this is, you talking about disoriented. And I'm not just talking about the light that hit him, okay? You're taking a man who has got all, of, all his act together, and he is in charge. He is the man, okay? 
And all of a sudden, you are shifting, and now he's no longer in charge. I mean, he can't do anything. He can't see. He, he, has, he has no control over what's going on in his situation. Somebody else is telling him what to do. And for three days, this, this man who had a, a, a vision to destroy those who were wrecking havoc, for three days, this man could not see. That would be enough to just really boggle your mind, right? That, that, just that would be enough to throw you off kilter and kind of change your, how you look at things. But worse than that was when he said, who are you? This voice said, I'm Jesus. That is what disoriented Saul right there. The voice said, I'm Jesus. This was the very individual who is at the root of the problem he was trying to stamp out. What did we say? Saul was a Jew, right? Saul knew who Jesus was. He knew who Jesus was. Now, he knew him to be a prophet, right? That's what, that's what Saul knew of him. He knew him to be a prophet. And this prophet had claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. Saul knew that. But Saul knew that he had been crucified and buried. And in Saul's mind, that was done. Now, of course, he had heard the claims that the disciples had made about he'd risen again. But see... His understanding of the scripture was that, yes, a resurrection was going to occur, but a resurrection was going to occur at the end of the age, okay? This was not the end of the age. And when it occurred, it was going to occur for all Jews, not just one. So this was really just messing with his mind right here. He, he couldn't wrap his head around the fact this is Jesus that's talking to me? I thought you were dead and buried. How would you feel if someone that you thought was dead and buried suddenly started talking to you? That would be a disoriented, per a disoriented moment. Saul didn't want any part of all those rumors that Jesus was alive. Not at all. But imagine sitting there trying to rectify this in his brain at that moment. This is totally against everything he's been taught. For Saul to be able to move forward to do what God was going to have for him to do, God had to disorient him. God had to change his way of thinking. Okay? Okay? He had to first be brought to his knees. For him to truly be able to see, God had to blind him. You ever thought about it like that? For a new world to come into view, his old world had to be leveled. That's tough. Everything he had built his life around, all of a sudden in this one moment, in this encounter with Jesus Christ, everything he had built his life around was coming into question. And that was very hard for a learned man to understand, to tolerate. And it was at this moment that he begins to rethink or to reimagine so he's gone through disorientation. Now he's coming to reimagination. Okay? It's like, hmm. I got to rethink this. Let's pick back up in verse 7 right there. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. In other words, he was blind. 
They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. The encounter on the Damascus road forced Saul to reimagine everything he had ever thought of. Matter of fact, we're going to find that he spends the next several years rethinking all of these things. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verses 4. We're going to start in verse 4. Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 4. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh... If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. What did I tell you a minute ago? Saul knew who he was. He knew, he knew his ancestry line as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless, is what he's saying. But listen to what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, what's he talking about there? All this long list he's just made, all these things that were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. This is reimagination on steroids. He has taken... Everything that he was so proud of, his lineage, his education, his knowledge, his control, all of those things that were so vitally important to him when he had this encounter with Jesus Christ and he became disoriented because all of this other stuff was playing in and he began to realize and rethink things Not with his own eyes, but through the eyes of Christ. He began to realize that none of that was important. None of that stuff was important to him anymore. And he he tells the Philippians, he said, I count it all loss. I don't need that anymore. Think about what he had been taught. Paul had been taught there's one God. Okay. One people chosen by God to bring blessing to the world and one future for the world. Well, Miss Phyllis, I thought there was just one God. Well, sure. And you need to understand that so that we don't fall into idolatry. But Saul had to wrap his mind around the fact that there's one God, but he's represented by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that was a new concept for him. Okay? So he had to wrap his mind around that. And what about the, there's one people that are chosen to bring the blessings of God to the world, the Jewish people, and what happened to that? Well, Paul stands and claims in Galatians there's neither Jew nor Greek. Okay? There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. So that whole idea, he had, to, he had to rethink and reimagine. And then like we said earlier about, about the resurrection, you know, he thought, yes, there's going to be a resurrection and it's going to be an end time resurrection and it's going to be a resurrection of the Jews. And now all of a sudden he recognizes that here's a resurrection of Jesus Christ. What they had been saying was true. This man had come back from the dead and here he is right here and he's already ruling and reigning right here in the middle of time. And so he's like, wow, I, I got to rethink this. Paul had to reimagine everything that he'd ever known. But you know what? When we come to Christ, we're invited to do the same thing. 
We are invited to rethink everything that we have ever known, everything that we have ever thought was important. Sometimes the Lord has to put us on our knees to get our attention. Sometimes he has to blind us so that we will see what he wants us to see. But when we can catch a glimpse of him and we can understand the direction he's going and what he wants from us and we can reimagine that in our mind and we can, instead of having a world view, we can have a God view. When all of that begins to happen, when Christ meets us right there where we are, like we said this morning, he met the woman at the well. He met her right where he knew she was going to be. He did the same thing with Saul. He positioned himself right there to, to encounter Saul right in the middle of what Saul was fixing to do. And Jesus pops on the scene right there. And what happens is Christ meets us where we are. And he invites us to journey with him out of our brokenness into his wholeness. Out of our brokenness into his healing. That's where he invites us to go. And you know how we get there? We get there in the third thing that happened to Saul. First, he had disorientation. Second, he had reimagination. But none of that was worth anything until the third thing happened. And you know what the third thing was? It was transformation. Because what did we say this morning? When we encounter Christ, when we encounter the risen Christ, we're going to be changed. We're going to be transformed. And this is what happened to Saul. He had always been a man on a mission. You know what? That didn't change. That didn't change. He was still a man on a mission, but his mission changed. Okay, instead of going out to persecute the church, he had this Damascus Road experience and God took him with all of his skill set that he had. Just imagine this. Okay, Saul was a brilliant man. Brilliant. God needed that. So he took Saul with all of his skill set and all he did was simply turn him around when I, was, when I was a little girl, we used to play with those wind-up toys. They were little metal things and very annoying. And you could wind them up and you could set them on the floor and they would walk until they ran into a cabinet. And then they'd just sit there in that cabinet doing that continually until, until it winds down and then it stops. Well, now, my gracious, we have vacuum cleaners that you turn on and they go all over your house and they run into a wall and they back up and regroup and they go another direction. And I thought, what a beautiful, beautiful sight of what happened to Saul. So God took all of that energy that Saul had and, and the, the mission and the purpose and what, what Saul's giftings were in the flesh and he repurposed him and he gave him a new mission and Saul ran just as hard for Jesus as he was running against Jesus because there had been a transformation with this encounter on the Damascus Road. The most passionate and purebred of Jews would become the apostle to the Gentiles. Now stop and think about that. Stop and think about the miracle that that is. He became a great missionary. He became a church planter. And he was a champion for the same cause that he had tried to snuff out. The one-time persecutor of the church would suffer immense persecution for Christ. Total transformation. But you know, Saul didn't see it like that. He saw what was happening to him as taking part in the sufferings of Christ. We talked about this in Sunday school a little bit this morning. And according to historical accounts, what we can find, he did lay down his life for Christ. What a transformation. 
What a change had taken place. Encountering Christ changes people. It changes people. So we've talked about two different people today. We've talked about this morning the rejected woman with a sordid past and no self-esteem. And tonight we've talked about a Pharisee who's puffed up with his own importance. But in each instance, Christ met them exactly where they were, took them exactly as they were. But praise God, he didn't leave them there. He totally transformed them. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is what? The same as he was yesterday? The same as before he met Christ? No, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. Adrian Rogers once said it like this. If your religion hasn't changed your life, you might ought to change your religion. If your religion has not changed your life, you might ought to change your religion. We know it's got nothing to do with religion. It's all about relationship, right? Everybody will be changed when they meet the Lord Jesus. Radically, dramatically, eternally, visibly, spiritually, emotionally changed when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I'm not talking about a caterpillar change into a butterfly. Okay? We're not talking about a tadpole change into a frog. That's not change. That's, that, that's a natural process right there. Okay? No, I'm talking about the kind of change that happens when a prince, when a, when a princess kisses a frog and the frog turns into a prince. That's change. That is change. When we can be kissed by grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, it should transform us. And the beauty is that he uses what we have. He uses who we are because he created each of us to be who we are. You know, this morning I said he created all of us ladies, each with gifts and talents, and, and, and we all do things differently, but he created us that way. He wants to use all of those things, but he wants to use it for his mission and his purpose. So, i got a question for you. Are you still talking about when you encountered Christ? Do you tell people about, well, when I was 11 years old, I encountered Christ, I gave my heart. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I haven't encountered Christ since I was 11 years old... Something's missing. Something's missing. I can promise you that this was not the last time that the woman at the well encountered Christ. I can promise you that this right here on the road to Damascus was not the last time that Saul encountered Christ. The reason that Saul went on to do the things that Paul, as we know him, Paul, went on to do the things that he did, and we have countless books in God's Word that he has written, is because he had an encounter with Christ every single day. So there's nothing wrong with me telling you I encountered Christ at an altar when I was 11 years old and I gave my heart to him, and that's great and wonderful, but I need to tell you. But not only that... I encountered Christ when I was 15. I encountered Christ when I was this. I encountered Christ when that. You know what? I encountered Christ yesterday. You know what? I encountered Christ this morning. I talked to him today. Because transformation is an ongoing process. Where are you at in the process? 
Where are you at in this encounter process? Are you still in the disorientation stage where you're not quite sure which way is up and some of the things that you have held on to all of your life, this COVID world has rocked you, this political world has rocked you, and you're sitting a little disoriented in what's going on? Or maybe you're in that stage where you're reimagining, you're trying to think about how things, and I'm not just talking about your entire life. Maybe there's one area in your life that you're struggling to give up and turn over to him, and you're sitting there and you're saying, but this this didn't happen the way I thought it was. Now, I'm preaching to the choir, okay, tonight. This didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen, and it's got me disoriented. Does that make sense? And so now I have to reimagine, okay? And I have to reimagine and I have to grasp what God is trying to get me to see. And then I have to say, okay, God, transform me. Take me and turn me. Take me and mold me. Take me and, and do with me what you want. So we may be in various stages of these encounters tonight. But I want to encourage you, if the woman at the well could encounter Jesus and be dramatically changed, if Saul could encounter Jesus and be dramatically changed, then we can encounter Jesus and be dramatically changed. And if there's something that you might be struggling with tonight, You're having a hard time, and it's got you disoriented. Hang in there with it, okay? Because disorientation can be part of the process, as we just saw this tonight. Hang in there and ask God to show you how to reimagine it, how to restructure it so that you can see it not through your eyes but through his eyes. And then watch as he transforms you. Amen? Watch as he transforms you. There's a prayer of a man by the name of St. Brendan. He was a voyager. He was from Ireland about the 5th century. And he offered this prayer. And I'm not much on one for reading prayers. You know, I believe prayers need to be heartfelt. But I believe these are some powerful words. He says, Lord, I will trust you. Help me to journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give me the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. Christ of the mysteries, I trust you to be stronger than each storm in me. Strengthen me with your blessing. Appoint me to the task. Teach me to live every day with eternity in view. Tune my spirit to the music of heaven. Feed me and somehow make my obedience count for you. You want to see revival? You want to see revival in Choctaw County? You want to see revival in your family? Sometimes you got to let God disorient you a little bit. And you got to reimagine a few things. But transformation starts with you. And it starts with me. So tonight as we close, I'm not going to have a formal dismissal. What I want you to do is I want you to come and find a place around this altar. And I want you to ask the Lord, say, God, would you show me some areas in my life that I need to reimagine? You show me some areas in my life 
But maybe they've got me disoriented right now. But I need to reimagine them. And I need you to transform. And then be like Saul. Lord, what would you have me to do? What do you want me to do? This man who is in power, who is in supreme authority, says, I surrender. I surrender to you, Lord. You want a fresh move of God in your life? You want a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in your life? Put yourself to your knees and allow the Lord to help you reimagine and transform. Would you stand tonight? Would you come and find a place at these altars just to lay your heart before God tonight and ask Him to make this change in your heart and your mind to give you fresh vision?